We all know the importance of family. We're also aware that there is safety and strength in numbers. But it seems that humans aren't the only ones that know that. So do animals. <laughs> They can be strong alone, but even stronger in groups, like these animals, for example. From packs of wild dogs to the complex social structure of elephants, here are 15 unbelievable strong pack animals in the wild. Number 15. Lion Pride. A pride of lions is entirely worthy of mention because these predatory cats do things differently from most others. Think about your average house cat. They hunt alone, and so do most predatory cats. For the most part, lions don't. Some may travel or hunt alone or in pairs, but they also mostly live in prides. The structure of those prides can differ between Asian and African lion subspecies. Most consist of about three males and up to ten females, along with their young. However, there have been prides with up to 40 members spotted. Could you imagine living with 40 family members? What a nightmare! Asian subspecies sometimes operate a bit differently. They often live in gender-specific prides, with males and females only coming together when it's time to mate. For the most part, members of the African pride stay together from birth to death, although some females can be expelled. Because they live in such a tight-knit group, it's not uncommon for all female lions to be related to each other. Male cubs are a bit different, though. They'll stay with the pride for about three years before leaving to form a new pride or take over another. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 14. Hyena Clan If you're gonna compare your school's social groups to any animal species, then it would be the hyena. The two probably have more in common than you might think, and even the same levels of drama. Hyenas form clans of up to around 100 members, with all those members part of a complex social hierarchy. Females are at the top of the pecking order, possibly due to their levels of aggression compared to the male, who tends to be a little calmer. Male hyenas will leave their clan after puberty in search of a new one. In that new clan, they'll become the lowest ranking member, even lower than the offspring of any females in the clan. But because they can add diversity to the group, they often stand a better chance of getting the ladies. The hierarchy of the average clan is quite complex, almost like a political party. There's the highest ranking matriarch who has a few matrilineal kin groups underneath her. In most situations, the older the female, the more powerful she is in that group. Number 13. African Wild Dog Packs African wild dogs are carnivorous mammals that live in Africa and are considered to be endangered. Their population is dwindling due to a combination of being killed and hunted by farmers fearing for their stock and because of their susceptibility to disease. Living in packs can help them in the first instance, but is probably more of a hindrance in the second. Still, these wild dogs live in huge numbers throughout Africa. In these packs, there's usually a monogamous breeding pair. When she has pups in numbers of 2 up to 20, the entire pack cares for them. They will also share their food and care for those members who are ill or weak. They interact by using vocalizations, actions, and touch. When they go hunting, African wild dogs hunt in cooperatives of around 20 members, although as their numbers dwindle, their hunting pack sizes are becoming smaller. Though the larger the pack for hunting, the more capable they are of taking down large animals like wildebeests. They'll also eat birds and rodents to supplement these larger kills. Number 12. White Rhino Crash 
most rhinos have very little patience or tolerance for other rhinos. As a result, they tend to be quite solitary animals, except when mating and raising their young. Although the white rhino bucks the trend a little bit here. They live in groups of a dozen or more because they see the value in a safety in numbers approach. You can, of course, see white rhinos living alone, but they tend to feel safer when they have a group to call their own, and they use this group approach quite inventively. When they're on high alert, they will stand in a circle looking outward so that they can have a 360 degree view of their surroundings. Sometimes their young are in the middle, being protected by any suspected threat. All rhino species use vocalization to communicate, but white rhinos have a more advanced communication system. This is most likely because their groups are much larger. They each have their own call, which helps members of the group tell each other apart, even from long distances. Even if they don't recognize the rhino, though, the call can also signal the age, sex, and social status. Number 11. Wolf Pack. Even if it doesn't look like it when you'd see wolves embroiled in a scrap, they actually have a pretty sophisticated hierarchy. They organize themselves into packs of up to seven wolves, with an alpha male and an alpha female at the head of the pack making all the decisions. Gender doesn't often play a part in who becomes the leader, but rather strength. The alpha pair is also generally the only pair to mate. It's rare to come across wolf packs with several female wolves. They fight with each other much more than males, so they tend to separate out and form other packs. Next to the alpha pair is the beta wolf. They are the second in command and take over the role of the alpha male if he should die. Sometimes he'll even remate with the alpha female. At the bottom of the pack is the omega male. They are the least cared for members of the pack and are sometimes bullied. Rather than play the role of a punching bag, omega wolves sometimes leave the pack and take a solo journey. Number 10, Crocodile Basque. If you don't have much tolerance for other people, particularly in a group environment, then you were probably a crocodile in a past life. Crocodiles may be the most social of reptiles, but that doesn't actually mean they are that social. They don't form social groups, but will tolerate each other for the most part when they are feeding or basking. Most species are also not territorial, but the saltwater crocodile is an entirely different kettle of fish. They are both territorial and aggressive, and won't tolerate being around any males. Fortunately, most other species are a little more agreeable to company. The largest and heaviest male is always at the top of the food chain, and he has access to all the best basking sites. Next in line are females, which have priority over a carcass or a big kill. Nile crocodiles display this hierarchy the clearest. Out of all studied species, the mugger crocodile probably has the most tolerance. They will eat in groups and congregate in certain areas, though during mating season, males will be quite aggressive towards each other to avoid missing out on their lady friend of choice. Number 9. Cheetah Coalition Cheetahs have quite a complex living arrangement. But you could probably describe it as being quite normal compared to how some other animal families operate. Cheetah cubs will be seen with an adult male and female, or sometimes two or more adult females. Female cheetahs will live alone for most of their life, except for when they're raising their cubs. In contrast, males will live in coalitions of up to five members. Sometimes they will live alone. For the first 18 months of a cheetah litter's life, they will live with their mother. As soon as they become independent and can hunt on their own, they'll spend around half a year with their siblings, perfecting their hunting skills. After two years, females will reach sexual maturity and leave their siblings to start a solitary life. They may also join a group of unrelated females. The males, though, will stay together as brothers for the rest of their lives. If there's only one male in a litter, he will remain alone or join a nearby litter that he grew up living near. Number 8. Elephant Herd You won't find too many researchers who aren't impressed by the social structure of elephants. Even after years of research, they continue to be surprised and amazed by how complex their family dynamics are and how differently the males and females live their lives. 
females will mostly spend their entire life in the same herd. Because of this, most females in a herd are related, such as siblings, mothers, aunts, and sometimes even grandmothers. Most females in the average herd are also incredibly social. They will help each other to cool off in the hot sun by spraying water, dirt, and mud onto each other's backs, just like how we, in our family units, rub sunscreen on each other's backs. Even if some females leave the herd in smaller groups for a fresh start, they won't forget their roots. Their incredible memory allows them to interact positively with members of their old herd if they happen to see them again. In contrast, males tend to live alone unless they're looking for a mate. By the time they turn around 14 years old, they start venturing out from their herd more and more until they simply don't return. Some go on to live alone or join bachelor herds of male elephants. Number 7. Red-Bellied Piranha Shoal if you've ever seen the horror movie Piranha, then you've probably formed a few ideas about what the average red-bellied piranha looks like. You may imagine them traveling in big, vicious groups, devouring everything they find, even humans, within seconds. But surprisingly, most things you know or think you know about this fish are probably wrong. This South American native fish is a forager that feasts on worms, crustaceans, insects, and fish. They travel in shoals, as you would have seen in movies, but not for the reasons you might think. They only travel in large numbers to protect themselves against threats like dolphins, aquatic birds, caimans, and large piscivorous fish. While traveling in these groups, they don't hunt. Instead, they prefer to hunt alone or in much smaller numbers. The theory that they travel in large numbers to protect themselves rang true with a study involving a simulated predator attack. Their resting opercular rates were able to return to normal far quicker in shoals of eight than they did in shoals of two. That shows that they feel much safer in larger numbers than in smaller numbers. Number six, bird flock. You would define a flock as being a group of the same animal species living together. Birds exist in flocks during migration, but also for the benefit of safety from predators and foraging. They live in flocks of their own species, but also in mixed flocks. Mixed flocks tend to consist of birds of the same size and shape. Having multiple species in a single flock can increase their defense levels against predators. They also tend to have two very different sets of behaviors that work towards a common goal. These are called sally and gleaner. A sally is a bird that will guard the flock and eat prey in the air while flying. Gleaners will consume prey that lives within vegetation. Living together decreases the chance of an attack by a predator because, well, safety in numbers. Living, foraging, and traveling in flocks also means they can share information. When they go out hunting for food, some members of the flock can alert the entire flock to the presence of a food source. However, there is a social hierarchy, so the subordinate birds may miss out on something to eat. Number 5. Ant Colony Ant colonies are truly something special. They may be small, but they certainly become a force to be reckoned with in large numbers. These communal groups consist of one or more queens who lay eggs. Below her are sterile females who are the workers and soldiers of the colony. Seasonally, the colony also consists of winged sexual males and females. These winged sexuals, called elates, will leave the nest to look for other nests. However, the males die soon after, along with most of the females, although a few will survive to start new nests. The size of an ant colony is incredibly important to the survival of it. The numbers affect how they defend it, how they mate, their physical appearance, and how they forage. A colony can be as small as a few ants calling a twig home, or as large as a super colony with millions of workers, almost like comparing a village to a city. The size of a colony can also change with the Seasons. In the summer, it can have as many as 300 workers, but then over 2,000 of them working for the queen ant in the winter. Number 4. Plains Zebra Dazzle 
Plains zebras live in groups called dazzles, and these are closed family groups with a single stallion, several mares, and their offspring. While they tend to be nomadic animals, they also have a home range. The two locations can sometimes overlap. How these dazzles form is truly quite remarkable. A stallion will go out and either form or expand their harem by recruiting young mares from the harem in which they were born. Even when that stallion leading a dazzle dies, the stability of the group remains. Although this isn't the only social structure in existence, these family harems are common, but plain zebras can also live in a fission-fusion society. They gather into large herds and create subgroups within that herd. Individuals can also interact with zebras outside their group. Females in either group benefit significantly from the social structure. Males give them plenty of time for feeding while also protecting them and their young from the harassment of outside males and predators. But that's not to say it's all teddy bears and rainbows. Females form a dominance hierarchy within their groups based on how long they've been in it. The oldest member and her offspring are of course, the highest ranking members, followed by those that joined next, and so on. Number 3. Hippo Bloat Groups of hippos, or bloats as they're also called, are quite unique. While they tend to live in groups of around 10, it's not uncommon to see them in large numbers of about 30. However, some have also been seen in bloats as large as 200. The herd consists of several adult females and males, but there is only one dominant male. He can mate with any or all females in the bloat, but he does let subordinate males into the herd to mate with some of the females as well. That's not to say he doesn't show them who's boss, though. He reminds them that he's the group leader by flinging his dung as far as possible. Imagine doing that in our society. But not every hippo will get the hint, and fights do break out. Typically, when rival males meet, they will stand with their mouths open as wide as possible, nose to nose. This process is called gaping, and is essentially how they size each other up. Eventually, the smaller male will retreat, but that is not always the case. If they get into a fight, they use their tusks and swing their heads around like giant meaty sledgehammers while bellowing. Number 2. Giraffe Tower Groups of giraffes are called towers, which is hilarious when you consider how tall they are. These towers can consist of up to around 20 members, or sometimes as many as 50. Unlike other animals, though, their social ties aren't very strong. They will come and go as they please, and any member can leave at will. The strongest connection tends to be between a mother and her young. Some giraffes are more social than others, so the less social ones will often go out on their own before long. Although females are definitely more social than males, they tend to gather in towers of up to about a dozen members. Males are not often part of these towers unless they are still with their mothers. You could almost call these towers nursery groups because the mothers all take care of each other's babies while they go out to eat. Males operate differently. When they are old enough to leave their mothers, they will form bachelor herds. They play with each other, interact, and eventually form a group with a dominant member. Hilariously, they neck wrap kind of like a version of arm wrestling, to find out who's the toughest and can become leader. Number 1. Baboon True Baboons live in hierarchical groups of between 5 and 250 members, depending on the time of the year and the location. How these troops are formed can also depend on the species, as Hamadryas baboons and Savannah baboons can operate a little differently. Hamadryas baboons have quite large groups with many small harems consisting of four females and one male. They may also have a younger male, but they won't mate with any females until the older male is removed. This is probably because the males become incredibly jealous and controlling over their females. To the point where they'll actually grab and bite females that attempt to wander too far away. That doesn't stop other male baboons from coming into another harem to steal a female, though. Often, this results in aggressive fights and babies being taken as hostages or used as shields. If the outsider male wins, it's called a takeover. 
It all sounds vicious and awful, but there are nice moments too. Baboons are incredibly social and will comfort and support each other when they aren't squabbling or fighting. They definitely aren't sharers though. They collect and eat their own food, rather than sharing whatever they find. If you're like me, you probably wouldn't approach most of these animals by themselves, let alone in groups. And that is likely what they're aiming for. Have you seen any groups of animals before? How did you react? Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.